This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Let's get started here this morning. Um, Leroy, you can hand out the Sunday School lessons for today. All right, I, uh, this is work, uh, lesson 25 of Theology of Everyday Life. Work, purpose of our work now and for eternity. And while you're getting lessons, I thought I'd read a few funny things on job applications. I don't normally do this, but some of these were so funny, I'm like, I'm going to do this. Reasons for leaving the last job. Responsibility makes me nervous. These are actually things that have been written on applications. B, um, they insisted that all employees get to work by 8.45 every morning. Couldn't work under those conditions. C, uh, I was met with a string of broken promises, lies, as well as cockroaches. Can't imagine what they were doing for a job. Maybe, but you know, if it was an office, wouldn't that be horrible? Yeah. Oh, a hotel? Ew. Let's not go there. Uh, reason for leaving last job? I was working for my mom until she decided to move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of wonder. Um, the company made me a scapegoat, just like the three previous employers. Hmm, I wonder if you really are the scapegoat or the problem. Uh, or other special requests and job objectives. Please call me after 5.30 because I'm self-employed and my employer doesn't know that I'm looking for another job. <laughs> Try to compute that one. Um, I think we have a bipolar, maybe, or bipolar or something. Um, my goal is to be a meteorologist, but since I have no training in meteorology, I suppose I should try stock brokerage. Yeah, those are like two peas in a pod, right? They go together. Um, special requests, job objectives. I procrastinate, especially when the task is unpleasant. I'm thinking, why would you put that on an application? Uh, or here's a, two, uh, two more. Uh, small typos that can really change the meaning. I'm a rabid typist. Instead of rapid, it's a rabid. Um, instrumental in ruining the entire operation for a Midwest chain operation. Should have been running, not ruining. Um, anyway. All right. Lesson 25. We have, we've been talking about various aspects of work. And remember the whole series, the, what, is common seems, or what is common seems to be normal, and what is normal seems to be right. And that's not always the case, which is why we're looking into work here to see what the Bible says about it. We've seen how God is the divine worker. We've looked at some extreme attitudes towards work, false views of work. And now we're kind of honing in on man, the God-ordained worker. A, God made man to work. Yes, he gave time for our work. We talked about the cultural mandate with an overarching, overarching task of having dominion and subduing the earth. And the, today what we'll be hitting on is God gave purpose to our work. Now, before we even flip the page and go on, how do we even define what work is? What is work? Labor. Okay, labor. What's labor? <laughs> okay, doing a task that needs done. Okay. 
All right, uh, now you can flip the page. I have a, a definition from an author who did, a work on, he did some writing on the topic of work. Work is any set of tasks to be performed in pursuit of a particular goal. Now, does that definition include anything about money? But don't we normally think of work connected with money? <laughs> Unless you're a housewife, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even then, at the end of the day with ranching, you know, you do a lot of your work, you don't see the money now, but you see the money when you sell the cows and you see the money when... True. Yes. Um, I think that's important because I think maybe it's a millennial thing with the, that generation, but work is something that is just solely the way you earn money. And that's not actually a true or biblical view of work. Uh, think of an artist. Artists work long hours to make a painting or a piece of art or whatever. Do they always get paid for that? No. In fact, usually an artist's work is most valuable after they're dead. So I, I'm going to expose part of myself here. How many of you watch Hogan's Heroes? The old. In one episode, um, Colonel Klink is getting into painting. And Hogan is using that as a means to get. They're smuggling maps out in the back of the paintings Klink is, is making. And they're the most awful, torturous looking paintings. Uh, but Hogan has convinced Klink that these are beautiful pieces of art and that the art galleries will buy them, of which the art galleries do buy them because the art galleries know there's maps behind them. Anyway, um, he's convinced Klink that his work is really, really valuable. And then Klink at some point in the episode says, now, is there anything I can do to, to make these more valuable? He says, yes, you can die. Would you like us to arrange that? And Klink's like, no, 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 don't kill me. So anyway, that's the truth of artists. Bless their heart. Their work is most valuable when they're dead. Um, probably because they're not producing anymore. Uh, moving on here, though, uh, work is much more than what we do from 9 to 5 to earn a paycheck. Work is not simply cash in exchange for labor because many per people work without even getting paid. Any hobbies or interests that we pursue are work, but we do them because of the pleasure we get out of them. Think of a hobby that you have. How much work does it take? Uh, so you do knitting and crocheting or just... Crocheting and quilting. And then my wife has a plethora of hobbies. What are yours? One that came to mind was Okay. Yeah. You guys, any hobbies? Music? That's like hobby slash work for you guys. Um, yeah, when, when we were in high school, we played a lot of paintball. And I stopped to think about it. The work it takes to play a game of paintball is ridiculous. By the time you, you get your CO2 in your tanks and you get your equipment ready and you get all geared up for the whole thing and then you go out there and do it, um, you're running around, you're exhausted by the time it's done and then when you get done, you have paint and stuff all over you, you gotta clean it up, you gotta take care of it. And the guys who don't clean their equipment, well then, the next time they're out in the field, the previous balls that broke in the barrel now bust every other ball that's coming out so they're just now spraying paint and it only goes two or three feet. So there's a lot of work, even in the things we enjoy, but we do it because there's, there's pleasure and satisfaction in it. Um, Tim Keller uh, wrote this about work. Now, I, I should preface this. He's not my favorite guy to quote. He's got a lot of good literature. He runs in, I think, Presbyterian circles, if I'm not mistaken. But he's done a lot of, of work on, um, on different aspects of life. He said, work is as much a basic human need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, and sexuality. It's not simply medicine, but food for our soul. Without meaningful work, we sense, we sense significant inner loss and emptiness. Isn't that true? Without some sort of meaningful work in your life, you sense this emptiness. Um, work is so foundational to our makeup, in fact that it is one of the few things that we can take in significant doses without harm. 
Indeed, the Bible does not say that we should work one day and rest six, or that our, that our work and rest should be balanced evenly, but it directs us to the opposite ratio. Now, did you catch what he said there? Do you sense in our culture a desire to make work and play pretty even? Okay, everybody's shaking yes except so so. Kayla, what? Okay. 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 Okay, because what I was saying is people trying to get less work and more play, but yeah, okay. We're all, I think we're all on the same page then, because yeah, we want to play all day and do very little work. Um, and that hits back to one of the uh, extreme attitudes towards work of immorality, where people want more pay, more money for less work. And shall I say even less qualified work. You know, there are, there are people who do very little work, but the little bit of work they do is very significant and worth a lot of money, and they can make a good paycheck in a few hours a week because what they're doing has taken years to, to get that skill or develop whatever they're doing. Um, and I get that. Note from history here on the bottom of page two, in Greek, and I think also in Roman culture, the life of leisure um, was to be pursued and valued. The Greeks then would, they despised manual labor, and it was done by slaves, and they would bring in immigrants from all other countries around them to do the tasks that the Greeks viewed as degrading. Do you not see an echo of that in our culture today? Okay, one of, the, one of the things in our culture today is there's a lot of tasks that people are not willing to do, and we have this influx of immigrants, and I'm not talking immigrants who are legally coming through, but the illegal immigrants coming in, working jobs that, guess what? In my book, those should be jobs that the American high schoolers out there doing. You know, those should be jobs that, hey, if you can't get a job, you can get these jobs, and I've worked with landscaping crews, and I've worked with lots of minority groups, and I have no problem working with them. Some of them work very hard. But why is it that the Americans don't? <laughs> well, they value the dollar, but they don't want to earn the dollar. <laughs> I think, I think there's, a, there's a connection here between the ancient Greeks and Rome in, in America today, in our view of work, um, granted, over time, has God blessed our country? You bet he has. But that blessing didn't come from our forefathers sitting at home dreaming. It came from our forefathers getting out and doing something and working. And they founded a country, and they worked. They talk, uh, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, talks about the sacrifice that those in the World War II generation made. And I'll tell you, they made a big sacrifice, especially, he's got one chapter in that book dedicated to a black man who, man, the German POWs got treated better than the black American soldier. And that's a sad blot on our history. But those men were willing to sacrifice and work, and especially the black soldiers, they worked hard. They, they put up with a lot to defend our country for a place to live in. And now that we've hit a period of peace and prosperity, we're now hitting the attitude of let's play all day. Um, there's a loss of reality that, guess what, we can't play all day because there's other countries who, given opportunity and chance, would completely take over. You know, that's life. That's why we have a military. Um, so anyway, note from history, I thought that was interesting. Um, and again, what Tim Keller said on the work not being balanced, but being a six-to-one ratio, six days work, one day rest, is very true. If you're not working at something, then you ha will have a sense of emptiness. I wonder, 
and maybe there's studies to show this, I wonder if some of the riots and things that break out in cities are because there's a lot of people who don't work. Think about it. It creates unrest. They want to do something. I'm even shocked here in town. Um, the people who check their mail multiple times a day. Now, I'm not saying you're a bad person if you go to the post office two to three times a day to check your mail. That's not what I'm saying. But there's some individuals in our town who I'm there at 6.30 cleaning. And before I'm done, they'll be in and out of the post office three times to get their mail. And if the mail doesn't come, at one occasion I came back later in the day to mail a package and that person was there again showing up to check their mail. You have nothing better to do than make sure your Scott's Bluff paper or whatever comes in the mail today. Now they may be retired or whatever and that's fine, but there's a lack of purpose in life if that's what your life centers on. In fact, when, some, when people don't have purpose in their life, when they don't have something driving that they're doing, they tend to complain a lot about little things. They complain about all sorts of little things to where they make trouble for other people. And it's like, seriously, move on with life. But I think a lot of that comes from a lack of work. All right, page three. We work to glorify God on earth. Genesis um, chapter 1, verse 27 so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, um, created he the, him. Male and female created he them. Because God is a worker, we're made in his image. We are made to work. When we work, we express our creativity and subdue the earth. We bring glory to God. Now, because God gave us the command to subdue the earth, when we do it, what are we doing? We're obeying him. Does it not please the Lord when we obey the Lord? So that's, that's a significant element here to where you can now think about whether it's ranching or doing music or working at a, a fast food joint or mowing a lawn. You're thinking, I am actually doing something that is making the earth a better place. And in doing that, I'm actually obeying and doing what God wants. I think we don't normally think of it in that realm. Um, if, if we didn't mow the church lawn at all and let it get overgrown, how would it look? It would look tall, have tons of dandelions and weeds. Um, from an outside perspective, what would the outside world think? <laughs> yeah that we don't care about the piece of property we have. So there is, when we do those things, we're bringing glory to God because it shows that we care about keeping things neat and in order. And yes, I understand, you got on a prairie where there's uncut grass and it's blowing in the wind. That looks beautiful and great. There's a time and place for that, and that's clearly God's creation. But in town, if your yard looks like the open prairie... Uh, you're receding, yes. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1. And I want to briefly look at a few verses and compare them and think about a few things here. Genesis chapter 1. Am I missing something there? Oh. Anytime there's laughing, I think I'm missing something. Genesis. Oh, okay, one of those deals. Genesis 1, verse 5. He's been collecting handouts for too long. Uh, Genesis 1, 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and gathered together the waters, um, called he seas, and God saw that it was good. Now I want to compare those three verses to Genesis 2.19. Genesis 2.19 says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. 
What's the difference between the first three verses we read and the last one? Well, the first part was creation. Okay, it's creation. What was God doing in those first three verses? He was making her. He was doing work, but he's already done the work at this point. He's made it, and then what does he do to it? He called it. He named it. Now, if I give a stuffed animal to my child, they may give it a name. Do they have authority to give that stuffed animal a name? Why do they have authority? It is theirs. It is their possession. They own it. Through the creation narrative, God is naming the day and night. He's naming the seas. He's naming the land. He's naming the things he creates. Now let's read verse, chapter 2, verse 19 again. And out of the ground, God formed every beast of the field of the... Uh, okay, so God's doing the work. He, every fowl of the air, he forms that. He brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. What has shifted between the first three verses and this verse? Authority. God, in giving man dominion over the earth, he, he, was now, he was doing all the naming beforehand, but now he's bringing these animals to Adam to see what Adam would call them. He's giving Adam a measure of authority. As if, hey... You're the steward, you're the manager of this earth. You're, you're in charge to subdue and keep it. I'm giving you authority. What do you want to call this? And this is what's amazing. What name does God use for the different animals? He uses the names that Adam gave them. An interesting thought. God has all authority and power to create world to create the universe. God can do that at his whim, at his will. And and yet when it comes to exercising the authority of naming, he's named some things, but then he left other things unnamed and brings them to Adam. Because he wants Adam to work with him. He wants to work through Adam. Here we go. (laughs) Oh, Yeah, there we go. I was trying to think how that works with work somehow, but I I just couldn't get it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So anyway, isn't it interesting, though, between those verses, how God has shifted the authority to Adam? Now, Adam, best we can tell, named the animals in in generalities. But boy, haven't scientists named them all down to a T today? (laughs) You got kingdom five. What's that? Yeah, and, and names that most of us can't pronounce. Um, so all of that on authority and naming, it's Adam did that. Adam named the animals because God told him to. And in doing so, God now calls the animals by what Adam gave them for names. And that glorifies God because Adam did what God wanted. Our work brings glory to God because he first gave us work to do. And when we do it, we are glorifying him. Be here. Not only will we work to glorify God on earth, but we will work to glorify God in heaven. Work before sin entered the world. Work was a part of the paradise in Eden. So it's not bad. It's not evil. We've already covered that with false views. To work or to be a worker is to be human. Uh, Back to what Tim Keller said, it's part of our makeup of life. In the millennium, we will rule and reign with Christ. Does ruling and reigning take work? (laughs) Yes and no. We often view the person in charge as the person who is uh, most free and most... um, They have the most servants unto them to do their bidding, right? And yet, 
if you've ever been in charge, you realize there's a weight of responsibility on things, and there's a weight of coordination and getting things together. And um, if you've been a manager, you know that sometimes just getting people to do what they're supposed to do is not always easy. Now, granted, we are talking to the millennial kingdom, so then I suppose everybody in then and, and on into eternity would be working as they should. But maybe probably not in the millennial kingdom because again satan leads a rebellion there before it's all over but the point is to rule and reign takes a measure of work uh to the israelite there's some interesting prophecies given that give us this glimpse into the eternal kingdom or the at least the millennial kingdom but see once satan's at the end of that once he's done away with and death and hell are cast into the, the lake of fire, that millennial kingdom kind of branches into eternity, into, into heaven for all of eternity. Micah 4.4 4 says, But they shall sit, every man, under his vine, and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So we'll actually own private property. You'll have your own place. And then Isaiah 65, 22 says, they shall, not, or they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Isaiah here is talking about the millennial kingdom and on into eternity is this not the language of work? You're going to work and, and you're going to own it, but other people aren't going to take the fruit of your work and labor. Other people aren't going to be taking away what you do. It's going to be yours to enjoy. You will be able to enjoy the work of your own hands. Isn't that one of the problems with work in our world today? You work with your hands, and so often another person takes that. You work hard to produce something, uh, and other people take it away. Uh, piracy. I know, but I doubt it. some of us in here even know what it means. We think of pirates on the seas as taking away gold from other people, all right? Uh, and there are modern-day pirates who do that type of stuff. Um, obviously, their ships are not wooden anymore. But, but think of the piracy that takes place in the music industry or the video industry, where they illegally copy things and sell them for profit, and instead of the person who, guess what? The director needed to get paid, and all the actors needed to get paid, and all the stunts done in the movie, guess what? They cost millions of dollars to do. All the different things that go into a production. When you copy and you distribute and sell that without them getting their cut, you're taking away their income. That same is true, I guess, with anything from Microsoft software to Apple or whatever, you're taking away someone's income. That will not happen in the millennium. It, we will work on to eternity, and we will enjoy the fruit of our labor. Um, and again, that was a, a thought that kind of hit me this week as I was thinking and dwelling on this. There are things to do in life that some things I don't like to do. There are some things you don't like to do. For some of you, if you have to fix something on a computer, you might as well just throw it in the trash. It's not what you want to do. There are some of us who, when something goes wrong on a vehicle, we might as well just take it to the mechanic because we, we don't deal well with that. We don't. But there are things that we enjoy doing, things that we enjoy working at. Think of an artist again. They enjoy the painting. At least I hope so. Um, not all artists enjoy their work. Uh, an example of that, who wrote Sherlock Holmes? Does anybody know? Okay. Uh, Charlotte Colin Doyle? Sir Arthur Colin Doyle. Doyle. There we go. Got it. Did you know he actually hated the Sherlock Holmes series? He despised them. In fact, he wrote them just simply to make a living. And he had some other more significant works that he was working on. But everybody liked... Sherlock Holmes so much, he had to keep writing them just to keep money coming in. And in fact, in one point in the series, he kills off Sherlock Holmes because he wants to be done with the series, but then he runs bankrupt or whatever, and he has to bring him back alive in another book. 
So you could actually despise the work you're doing. Uh, I don't think heaven is going to be a place where we are doing the work we despise to do. We'll be working. We'll be doing profitable things. We'll be working for the Lord, but it'll be things that we enjoy doing. And last thing here, Revelation 22, 3. We'll serve the Lord forever. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Does not service quantitate some level of work? Now, I want everybody to close your eyes. I should have done this earlier. And think about what do you view heaven like? Do we normally view heaven in the realm of working? How many of you have pictures? You can look this way. How many of you have pictures in your mind of floating on clouds with harps and pearly gates? <laughs> okay. I think that comes from literature and on through Hollywood and other things. Um, I don't think that's what heaven's going to be like at all. Now, I, I think that may be, that may be what like, the New Jerusalem is like. I, I don't know. I've never been there. True. What are the dimensions of the new Jerusalem? I don't remember them exactly, but they give the length, the width, and the height, right? Wait a minute, height? Height of a city? It sounds like a big cube to me. Um, I, I don't know how all this works. And again, God drops hints in heaven of, or in the, not in heaven, God drops hints in scripture of the future. And when the Old Testament prophets, and when even the New Testament writers, when they saw some of these things, they didn't fully understand how they would work out. The New Testament writers could see some things that the Old Testament prophets didn't see, because they saw them being fulfilled, they saw them being worked out. And the same is true of us today. As we read our Bibles, there's hints dropped of the future. And we like to try to organize them and put them into eschatology and different schemes and how it's all going to work out and how this happens and that happens. But the reality is, I don't know for sure. God's in charge. He's dropped some hints along the way. The people in the millennial kingdom will probably look back and think, oh man, those crazy churches and what they thought about this. They didn't see this, this, and this coming. That's okay. God is in control. He's in charge. We're depending on him. But in heaven, we will work. And it'll be enjoyable. We're, um, well, some people have said, and it, heaven will be like a perpetual church service. And you know, to some people, that's like the most miserable thing they could ever think of. <laughs> and you think about it. Some of us enjoy being out in nature. A perpetual, forever, never-ending church service would be miserable. Yeah. It might be. Because New Jerusalem is supposed to be where the synagogue was. Right. And so they would come into the synagogue and there was always worship at the no, temple. synagogue, though. Temple, yeah. Um, there was always worship at the temple. Right. But you weren't always at the temple. There's lands to be yeah. taken care of. So when you go into the city, that's that purpose. Yeah, and that's true. You, you would have then the city where there's always a consistent worship before God. Um, but not necessarily everywhere in heaven. I mean, heaven has gates for coming in and out. I'm just telling you, there's a lot of stuff about heaven I haven't figured out. Because guess what? I haven't been there yet. The what? The the yeah, that's... <laughs> so then... So then I'll just raise up a couple other questions about heaven. So there's 12 gates in heaven, right? So which of the 12 tribes end up on the 12 gates? Because if you count all the tribes, you get about 14. You go back to... <laughs> the original. Okay. So then the, one of the apostles is on each of the gates. So who ends up on gate number 12? Is it Matthias? Is it Judas? It, probably not Judas. Uh, is it Paul? You know, uh, we don't know. <laughs> you know. Oh, okay, yes, there's foundations and there's gates. Um, anyway, let's close out with this. The purpose of our work is to glorify God 
both now and for eternity. Our work brings glory to him and will bring glory to him in the future because it is in response to his design for us. Uh, Think about this from another realm, too. If you make something, you make a device to make your life easier. Now, that could be anything from an automobile or a special tool or a cart or something you're using to, to make a certain task you do easier. Does that not tool not please you when it does what you designed it to do? God is pleased when we do what we are designed to do. So I hope that helps you view work in a different light this week, whether it's um, putting up with snotty nosed kids in a music studio or <laughs> ranching or, or being a stay-at-home mom or, or whatever. Um, God has made us to work, and whatever work, legitimate work we are doing, because there is illegitimate work, whatever legitimate work we are doing, we are bringing glory to him. Let's close. Any questions before we close out? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you've given us, and thank you that you have designed us to work. And Lord, although we're working in a fallen world, and work is not always enjoyable, and it not always is is fair, and sometimes the fruit of our labor is taken away. Lord, we recognize that work was in paradise in Eden, and we recognize that work will be in the future, in the millennial kingdom, and on into glory. Lord, would you help us this week to have the right attitude and approach to work? Would we see our work as honoring and glorifying you? We ask this in your son's name. Amen.